the President and Chief Operating Officer and a member of the Board of Aviation Corporation. And for those who don't know, ALC is a leading aircraft leasing company. Uh, ALC owns today 207 aeroplanes and uh, provide leases to customers all over the world. In fact, 77 different airlines in 47 different countries. Um, John has also been called to testify in the US House of Representatives and in the European Commission. Um, on leasing business because he is a recognized world expert uh, in this business. Uh, he's a pilot, in fact he flew up here himself um, in a Gulfstream airplane and holds an FAA ATP license and multiple jet ratings. Uh, John is also a member of the Board of Spirit Aero Systems and has non-profit board memberships at Pepperdine University and on the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. John is also, of course, a board member here at Wingspot, and perhaps equally important is the president elect for next year uh, here at the Wingspot. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our friend and colleague, John. Well, thank you so much, Barry. It's truly an honor and a privilege for me to stand before you today uh, giving this address to the Wings Club. You know, the Wings Club has assumed an increasing importance in the aviation world theater. I think these lunches and the test and the and the discussions that we engage in at these forums are extremely valuable and important. But I want to thank all of you for coming today and supporting the Wings Club and also especially thank for Airlies Corporation our many business partners who are represented here today, our financial advisors, our investors, uh, Boeing and Airbus, GE, Pratt & Rolls, many of you who have supported and believed in our company from the very, very beginning. And because a lot of you are such keen supporters as well as the uh, of, of the Wings Club, in my discussion we're actually going to have more of a collaborative effort, and so a number of the slides that I'm going to be showing have been done in collaboration, or in some cases provided by Airbus and Boeing, as we all look at this uh, matters that I'm going to talk to you about on an industry-wide basis. Before we get going, I just want to introduce a couple of other uh, three people in the audience, part of our organization, who helped make it great. And I'd like to first start by introducing Greg Willis, our Senior Vice, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Greg. Second member of our leadership team, Ryan McKenna, our Vice President, runs our Strategic Planning and Investor Relations. My capable assistant Molly Costa, who keeps my schedule and work life well organized. Thank you for that, Molly. So, Barry's asked me to come and speak to you today uh, a little bit about the Airlines Corporation, a little bit more about aircraft leasing, but also to talk about, I think, a very important subject, something that we've actually talked a lot and has been raised a lot on Wall Street this past summer. And specifically, Barry asked me to talk to you about our views on any upcoming order bubble. Is the industry in a bubble? Have we got too many orders? Are we at the peak of a cycle? Important to us as a company with all the aircraft that we have on order. So I'll do that. Before I do that, our lawyers want to make sure and remind you <laughs> that as a publicly held company, a lot of things that I'm saying are speculation. They are forward looking. All of you know what that means in a sophisticated crowd. I would urge you not to minimize it, but take that into consideration in all the remarks I've been making today. Wait, I'm not finished reading. Okay. <laughs> Our capable counsel here would, would like to reread. We'll, we'll give you that opportunity, Bob. So, a brief summary on, uh, on Air Lease Corporation, founded in March of 2010, as most of you know, by the one and only Steve Mozzie, godfather of the aircraft leasing industry, uh, founder also of ILFC. Founded in March of 2010, we concluded a very successful IPO only one year and one month after our founding. In fact, in April of 2011, at the time, the New York Stock Exchange told us it was a, one of the fastest uh, IPOs from a company start that they have ever done. A couple of years later, in fact, three and a half years after our founding, we continued that track by obtaining investment grade ratings, first from Kroll, an A minus level rating in May of 2003, and then from S&P a triple B minus rating in August of 2013, something that we as a management team are very, very proud of. 
Finally, over the past couple of years, although our management team over the past 30 years has launched about 10 different aircraft types, we at ALC, in fact, we launched customers for the Boeing 787-10 in June 2013 at the Paris Air Show, and then finally this last year at Farnborough for the A330-800 and 900neo that was uh, announced in July of 2014. Our company was one of the, one of the first launch customers of that aircraft. So as Barry mentioned, sitting here today, we have 207 aircraft in our fleet out flying today on least to 77 countries, uh, uh, 77 airlines across 47 countries. And a lot has been talked about our order book. And in fact, I can tell you when you add everything up today, we in fact do have the largest single order book of any aircraft leasing company in the world today. A total of 419 aircraft on order. 379 of those, as Barry advised, are firm. 15 are on option, but 25 are on MOU. The 25 MOU are the A330 NEOs we just announced in 2023. We actually take, expect to take delivery of all those aircraft, making us the largest uh, lessor backlog in the world. With this great platform, we've been ex able to execute a very, very good growth path for our company starting in the first quarter of 2011 uh, with a balance sheet of about $2.8 billion. And just finishing the most recent quarter now, over $10 billion in, in uh, assets in some three years, three and a half years, an increase of about 261%. That fleet expansion has driven our growth in the top line revenue in the same period of time from Q1 of 11 to the most recent second quarter of 2014. Our revenue has grown some 366% that we, as we've added aircraft at a rapid but a judicious pace. And finally, our pre-tax income growth. Pretty spectacular numbers from the first quarter of 2011 all the way to the second quarter of 2014. Over an 1,800% increase in our pre-tax income, income growth. But I would also point out to you, from a Wall Street perspective, our pre-tax margin, which is the highest in the uh, industry, the highest of the, uh, of the publicly held aircraft lessors, has been tracking the mid-37%. We can talk about pre-tax income actually for one reason. We're not domiciled in Ireland or any other jurisdiction. We're actually domiciled in the United States, and we're subject to U.S. tax laws, and we provision for those tax laws. But pursuant to the Internal Revenue Code, as we keep buying lots of capital equipment, we're allowed to depreciate that equipment on a much more accelerated basis, putting us into a tax law situation, therefore not a current taxpayer. So we are evaluated on the rating agencies, from the rating agencies and most others, on a pre-tax income perspective, which is why I talk about it. In that four plus years of time, we're very, very proud of what we've amassed in terms of our airline customer base. Sitting here today, flying all over the world, we've amassed a global customer base of 77 airlines across 47 countries with limited exposure to any one airline. That's important for us. The diversity of aircraft types the diversity of our exposures and placements and concentrations all around the globe do help mitigate our risk. And you can see this profile, some of you in the back might not be able to see all the tail logos, but we're very proud, all first from first tier uh, carriers, local carriers, recognized legacy carriers, all the way down to low fare carriers, and a variety of others, secondary, tertiary, in between, scattered all across the globe. Here's actually the content of our composite of our fleet sitting here at June of 2000, as of June 30, 2014. Uh, I'd like to point out most of our business, of course, this is by actually net book value of the aircraft. Most of our business in Asia Pacific, about 46%, about 35% in Europe, and the rest. And I'll just call your attention to the fact that most of our business is outside of North America. We tend to still attract here at the waist of a very US focused centered uh, 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 membership and group, we're actually expanding that quite a bit. In fact, the next speaker you'll have in November here at this function will be Ivan Chu, who's the CEO of Catholic Pacific. And for us, at Air Lease Corporation, the vast majority of our business is in fact outside the United States. With this order backlog now, a total of about 419 aircraft, firm, option, and MOU, what is our aircraft standard strategy? It's actually very simple. We're focused on buying brand new, the most technologically advanced, the most fuel efficient, the most environmentally friendly, and in the most high demand and most widely distributed aircraft that you can have on the planet today. So that consists of, on the Airbus side, the Airbus A320, 21, sorry, NEO, uh, current generation and NEO aircraft. 
Moving on to recently, the most recently announced A330, 800, and 900, NEO, for which we were the first launch customer. And then moving out the wide body spectrum to the A350, 900, and 1000. And in fact, on the Boeing side, same story, current generation 737, 800, the 737 MAX-809, and the 787-910, moving up to the wide body space. Again, we were a launch customer uh, two years ago on that aircraft. And then finally, the 737-300ER. In addition to the mainline aircraft, we also salt and peppered our fleet with some very good aircraft regionally. Uh, now the Embraer 175 and 190 seats. And then finally, the modest investments in the ATR 72-600 aircraft. These have been very good portfolio enhancers for us. They lead to relationships in airlines that we're able to place larger scale aircraft in the future. They've been nice margin enhancing so our airplanes for us. Uh, and they fit well into our portfolio. As we've launched more than 10 aircraft types over our careers, one of the things we've predicated our company on is strong uh, relationships with the manufacturers. And again, 419 aircraft in total. That distribution is a little bit different, 45% Airbus, a little bit edged to Boeing by units here, at 53% on that forward order book, and a small component of ATR of 2%. I'm going to talk a little bit about the wide bodies later in this presentation. We're a big believer in the wide body market, and so therefore, our future order book, a little more dominated than the single lot on the wide body side, 29% compared to what it currently is today, versus 71% for the single lots. Here's the derivation of exactly those orders and their deliveries and, and the quantities going forward, if you'd like to see. Some 10, uh, 12 a 321 200s, 25 a 3900s on the on the firm side for Airbus. Going forward, we'll conclude our agreements on the A330 NEOs. On the Boeing side, as I said, 737-800s, 89 MAX, 777-390ARs, and the Boeing 787-9 and 10. So for those of you that are concerned about math, we can give you those numbers. There you go. Now, Barry mentioned uh, initially about the increasing role of leasing in our industry today, and it is a very strong increasing role. Let's just start with a, a bit of a fact. We estimate that between 2014 to 2018, the industry is going to require about $640 billion for it to purchase the new aircraft that will be delivered in that time frame. If you take 40% of that $640 billion, you come up with a number that's $256 billion. And as we sit here in the world today, looking at all the top 10 leasing companies, I'm aware of many representing here today, my competitors, my colleagues, my competitors, and my friends as well. If you take that 256, but none of us, all told, collected together, have $256 billion over the next four years. The point here being, there's a lot to go around. There's a lot to be financed. This industry requires continuation of input of capital. Capital inflows have come to this industry and we need those capital inflows from all sources. If you don't already know, you might ask yourself, well, why, why is leasing 40%? Why are airlines leasing? What, what, what's the whole point? It's a pretty critical reason, some of which are the same, why you might want to lease a car instead of buy a car. First of all, usually less cash required. When you buy a brand new aircraft, the standard progress payment schedule for Boeing Airbus, about 30% of the purchase price of that airplane is paid during two years prior to delivery. So on a $100 million airplane, that's $30 million. The same $100 million airplane on a lease basis only requires usually about three to six months uh, or so of deposits, far less amount of cash. I think the most important aspect of why airlines lease today is fleet flexibility. If you do nothing more than read the newspapers, airline consolidations, mergers, code shares, alliances, it speaks to one thing, and that is the need to move your fleet the most efficient spots possible. And with a lease portfolio, you can do that much more efficiently. You're not stuck or right with an airplane for a long period of time. You can upgauge, downgauge in size, and it provides flexibility, which airlines are by and large willing to pay for. And finally, key delivery positions. These positions that we've amassed, 419 units through 2023, have become extremely critical going forward as we look at the record backlogs and the, over, and the over demand that we see from the marketplace to the manufacturers for new aircraft. Those key delivery positions in times like this are vital to the industry and are key to the success of our company. Finally, the elimination of the residual value risk. 
Bottom line, it means that airlines don't have to worry about financing aircraft. They also don't have to worry about selling and disposing of the aircraft. The leasing avenue takes care of all of that. Going forward, a lot of projections, most people agree, that as we move forward out to 2020, fully 50%, half of all aircraft delivered will be delivered pursuant to an operating lease. Where are we at this cycle? Are we in a bubble? Is there a word bubble? A couple of quick reflective comments. I've been in this business now almost 30 years. I've gone through three major industry cycles. Our board pays me to look for bubbles. It pays me to look for opportunities, but it pays me to look for risk. And across the spectrum, as we talk to the aftermarket suppliers, our engine partners, Boeing, uh, Airbus, everybody involved in the business, our BFE vendors, et cetera, et cetera, we're constantly asking the question, where are we? How are you feeling? Are you seeing any lack of demand? And let me start with our own backyard. As we announced in our recent earnings call, we at Airlease Corporation see absolutely no signs of throttling back of demand, no increasing conservatism or hesitation on the part of the airlines who require aircraft. In fact, the inbound inquiries to our company do nothing but increase. I wish I had more aircraft to give to them. I don't have enough aircraft. I have more demand and supply. But it's not just me. <clears throat> when I listen to Jeff Middle, or I listen to anybody else in the room who's in operating my store, I listen to the other lessors on their public uh, transfer calls. The same is reported. The same with Boeing, the same with Airbus. You look around the globe and you say, well, we have problems with Russia and Ukraine. We have political issues. We have Horribly unfortunate incidents like Malaysia Flight 17 and previous bad Malaysia Flight 370. China is slowing down. How can this all be? Is it all? Is it all just a? Is it all just a dream? Is it all going to? Is it all going to blow up? I'm going to go through a series of charts. Just let's see if we can walk through this together. And at the end of these charts, I'm hoping that you will ask yourselves the question that I'm going to ask you now, which is this. What bubble? These are headlines over the last 30, 60 days we've seen just picked up, picked up randomly. And it illustrates a point that I'm going to try and make to you over the next series of slides. We're a conservative company by nature, or risk averse by nature. We've been looking really, really hard at discernible, measurable indications that perhaps things are getting overheated a bit. But I can tell you, after all of our years of experience, after all that we've done, after all the customers we've talked to, we can't get there. And let's go through some of the reasons why I don't think we can get there. A couple of very basics. Let's talk about what's underpinning all of this. I've told you more than 90%, actually 95% of our customer base is outside, outside the United States. Still, it's true today that the global airline traffic doubles every 15 years, and it's projected to increase about 5% annually over the next four years. Let's talk about the, the increase of 5% annually in, in, in traffic. I think a lot of people don't realize the power of compounding. So if it's 5% today growth, that means next year's number is a bigger, a bigger, a bigger base. 5% of that number yet provides a bigger base for the next year. The compounding growth effect of passenger traffic is a tremendously powerful tool in this industry. It's something that I don't think people really recognize going forward. Just for your interest, these are the prospective uh, cumulative annual growth rates projected by region, Asia Pacific, no surprise, Middle East 6.3%, Africa 5.3%. These are the underpinnings of how market and traffic and the global market outlook uh, is looking going forward. What's fundamentally driving this? And apologies, this, uh, this chart's a little bit small. It might be a little hard to, to see Airbus help us uh, with these charts. These are simply two different metrics. One is real world GDP, year over year, quarterly evolution percent. So this is forecast 213, forecast 2014, the dark blue line. The 2014 blue line slightly shifted a little south compared to the prior year's forecast, but this is sort of May 13 to May 14, July, uh, 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 Q, Q1, sorry, it's a quarterly basis, Q1, 13, Q1, 14, et cetera. The bottom line is this. 
if you look at this chart, anything above the zero line means there's growth. In the entire world economy, and in fact, shifting over to commercial world trade numbers, same quarter to quarter increase year to year percent. You see the projection of growth going forward. Now, these only go out to 2015. We don't like to go on these world economy forecasts and world trade forecasts too far, but it shows the clear trend of growth and is supporting the airline growth worldwide today. Translating that to the airline industry, we see actually, this is a chart of monthly percentage growth one year to the next. So May of 13 to May of 14, et cetera, et cetera. So all these, all these little red blips are the mon monthly increase over the prior year's term in world passenger traffic. And although this says world ASK is available seat by uh, kilometers, it's actually, the air on this chart, is actually uh, revenue passenger kilometers, RBK. So this is traffic. And as you've seen in the uh, recent IATA announcements, traffic continues to be very strong and robust, holding up to 5%. I wish you could say the same on the freight side. The freight side has been in the doldrums. It's been in the slump in terms of air, uh, air freight over the past year and a half. But, but, it is recovering. That's an old number. June traffic freight up to 2.4%. The July number is closer to 4%. And probably the biggest indicator of all, I was very happy to see yesterday, my friend Jim Parker here from FedEx is in here. FedEx has released their earnings showing some pretty good, strong rebounding numbers for the freight side of the business going forward. So as we look at that, and we look at the passengers, we look at world commerce, et cetera, what has happened over a period of time? So this is a chart from IATA, and it basically says this. Over a 14-year period, 2000 to 2014, what has happened in the industry process? We all know what happened in the early 2000s, 911, many other factors, et cetera, et cetera. 2008, the financial crisis, obvious, obvious reasons. But look what has happened in the last several years. This year, finally, in 2014, for the, for, uh, the world airline industry is projected to record $18 billion of profitability. Now, that's not a lot. This industry still needs to improve its performance, sorry, on a cost of capital basis and on a financial return basis. But I think it one drives to one fundamental point. In order to get out of this hole, the airlines have had a never-ending quest to drive for improved and increased efficiency, fuel efficiencies, operating efficiencies, lower costs, and most of that is all driven by new aircraft that are the youngest, most fuel efficient, burn the least amount of fuel, and have the least maintenance costs going forward. Sorry, I keep, I keep moving this around. Apologies. Um, so again, over a 14-year period, the trend is undeniable. The fiscal conservatism, the capacity discipline that airlines are showing today, a much stronger management, a much stronger view towards risk than at any time before. And we believe that that's driving this profitability improvement, which will continue on an overall basis. But the most fundamental thing of all is this. Over the last 33 years, this is the growth in revenue passenger kilometers from 1990 all the way through the end of 13 and you're trending up through 14. If you don't know this metric, it basically means how many passengers are sitting, paying passengers are sitting in seats traveling a kilometer on an airplane. And this is in trillions of RPKs. This trend, undeniable, over some 33 years, a long period of time, a long period of data, a long period of looking back, we've gone through four recessions, two financial crises, two Gulf Wars, one oil shock, one near pandemic called SARS, and of course, the worst shock to our industry to date, 911. Certainly, we've had a couple of periods of level off. This is right after 911. Certainly, again, 2008, the financial crisis, right here. But the overall trajectory is undeniable. In fact, the rate of increase after periods of, of, of uh, dormancy or leveling off is faster every single time after we go through a period such as this. 
So when you talk about world events today, you talk about Russia, the Ukraine, the war we are now in with an entity called ISIS, or whatever it's being able to be called, airplanes being shot out of the sky. There's one fundamental fact that is not disputed, and that is that the world airline industry has become the world's form of mass transportation today for anything over about 500 miles. Most of you are not going to get on a bus anymore to go from here to Miami. You're not going to get on a boat to go from New York to London. It has become essential to the movement of people and goods across the globe. And this chart, more than anything else, is the most fundamental driver of airlines and airline predictability in the future, more than anything else. And not just people. This is revenue passenger kilometers. Let me point out, today, about 44% of all of the world's air freight and cargo traffic travel in the bellies of passenger airliners as opposed to dedicated freighters. This is how the world moves people and goods. And as long as the world population keeps increasing, we are in a good overall trajectory for the airline industry. Let me just share with you some astounding facts. This is a chart that shows of the largest airports in the world, Atlanta Hartsfield, churns about 95 million passengers a year. Number one airport in the world. By the way, anybody know it's number two? Beijing. Number three airport in the world is the passenger count, London Heathrow, seven in a year. But let me point out to you, so this is the annual traffic through Atlanta Hartsfield. This is the annual traffic through London Heathrow. Guess what? If we look at emerging Asia, the growth alone, the increase year to year provided by emerging Asia, which includes China on this chart, is 100 million passengers a year. Growth, growth, just in Asia alone. Far exceeding the annual traffic at Atlanta Hartsfield, the London Heathrow, or many of the top airports. So as we go forward in this quest for airline growth, efficiency, fuel efficiency, environmental friendliness, we tend to divide the world into sort of the order book into two sort of types. We have aircraft that are being replaced, like new aircraft, that's the replacement market, and we have aircraft that are being placed for growth. And these are the various growth and replacement numbers that we believe going forward from 2014 to 2033, this chart collaboration with Boeing. Um, it's not important, I think, that you look so much at the actual numbers, but rather the distribution. The light color, in fact, is the replacement market. Uh, the dark color, in fact, is the growth, the growth market. No surprise in the Asia Pacific, there's more growth potential right now than replacement. A uh, little, little uh, known statistic in China, three times the U.S. population, one-third the number of aircraft. So tremendous growth potential in the Asia Pacific. And then the more mature markets, North America and Europe, uh, actually dominated more by the growth cycle. I'd like to pause on that for a second and move forward. We're going to get back on the, on the replacement cycle. So let's start talking about this backlog, this thing that's accumulating, this huge amount of orders that we all know only exist with the manufacturer, particularly Airbus and Boeing. Record-breaking backlogs of all time. Let's just look at a couple of quick metrics here. So this is a chart that shows the backlog delivery lead time for all aircraft above 100 feet. So what does it mean? How long is it going to take in years for 60%, for example, of the backlog to be delivered? Well, in the case of this past year, 2013, it would take five years for 60% of the backlog to deliver. Going back 20 years, 1993, the great line, it would take for 60%, well, about one and a half. And then go forward 2003, still fresh after the 911 crisis, a little bit less, 60%, about a little over a year. Let's go out to 80%. Today, in order to deliver 80%, I'm going to have trouble with this laser pointer here, here we go. In order to deliver 80% of the backlog, it's going to take us seven years to deliver that. Compared with 1993, at about three years, and 2003, at about one and a half to two years. 
So today, the backlog extends at least three to four years far forward, more in the future than any time before. In fact, 40% of the backlog, 40% is expected to deliver beyond a period beyond five years from now, 40%. Let's take another look at another metric. This is simply, and this red line is simply, I think this thing to cooperate. Excuse me. I'm a pilot, and pilots always have backup systems in their aircraft, so here's a backup laser pointer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's go forward and let's look at this line, which is called the ratio of the backlog to production yearly rate. So these little light blue things are the number of uh, deliveries, uh, uh, the production rates. So this is, this is how long, again, it's going to take in years to deliver our backlog at the current production annual rate. You can see we're just under eight, about seven and a half years I mentioned earlier. So the bottom line is the backlog to the production rate ratio has almost tripled in the recent years, overwhelming demand for new technology efficient aircraft, overwhelming. Surely, with all these airplanes being delivered, yes, the demand is there, we need more fuel efficient aircraft, we need more. Surely these production rates are going to overwhelm the installed base. For sure, they have to. All of our experience indicates that. We're conservative people by nature. We've been burned by prior cycle before. So surely these high rates of production and backlog are going to flood the market, are going to flood our existing fleet. So starting in 81 through 2013. And the key here is deliveries as a percentage of the in-service fleet. And guess what? If we go forward all the way to the end of 13 and project all the way forward through the end of at least 18, and I suspect even farther, guess what? We're at exactly the historical average of 7.3% over the last 30 years. Meaning that as a percentage of the in-service fleet, we are not delivering any more aircraft as a percentage than we ever have before. This chart actually, I think, has another powerful message. This can be used as an industry cycle chart. This is 1984. This is 1994. This is 2004. Industry cycles tend to go in about 10 year horizon. So here they are. Again, as a percentage of the fleet, what percentage are you delivering every new year? And guess what? 84, 94, 2004. You can see the tremendous fluctuations in the years where we were at a peak, followed by a downfall. That percentage was well over 8% here. One remarkable thing on this chart that I'm going to propose to you. If you do nothing more than follow this line, what do you see? What you see is over a 30 year period, the amplitude of these cycles is in fact decreasing. We haven't seen any major spikes or any major draws compared to the historical norm. This I believe is one of the most key metrics that we look at as we go forward and say, how are we doing in a cycle? Well, actually, the cycles have dampened because we are consistently delivering only about 7.3% of our in-service aircraft volume every single year. So this cycle, over 30 years now, appears to be dampening with less amplitude. Let's move forward. So this record order backlog, bottom line, reflects unsatisfied demand. The largest single overall backlog, uh, backlog we've ever seen as a percentage of the in-service fleet in the chart before. Now over 50% of the backlog uh, as a ratio of the in-service fleet. Unprecedented demand, unprecedented need for aircraft airlines to increase their efficiency and lower their fuel burn, lower their maintenance costs going forward. So where does that leave us in terms of the backlog? Here's the bottom line. The record backlog exists simply express overwhelming and continued demand. The demand which we and probably the manufacturers don't see letting up any time in the near future. The fact of the matter is the production of aircraft is not keeping pace with traffic. Some articles recently about, well, the number of seats going in the market is actually bigger. That's probably true. 
but is keeping tra track and pace with the traffic growth. One other comment, not necessarily to de defend or on the side of manufacturing, but we look at this quite a bit at Ernest Corporation. What's the quality? What's the content of the backlog? The quality and the content of the backlog has never been better. There's more diversity in the backlogs at Airbus and Boeing. There is more, uh, there's more quality in the backlogs of Airbus and Boeing. Have certain airlines overordered? Yes, of course. But I can tell you one thing as an individual who deals a lot with the manufacturers. I think both Airbus and Boeing would be the first to stand up here at a net that they would love to get some of those positions back. They need some of those positions. They have overwhelming demand for those positions. So the extent of their softness in the, in the backlog, they need those positions. We, as a company, would take those positions in a heartbeat because we need them. So beyond just the backlog, the quality of the backlog, in our view, is defensible and has lowered risk overall. So, in the backdrop of all of that, record orders, record amounts of airplanes, record production volume, etc. Here's where we are today, and here is why, why I believe we at Airlines Corporation, and in fact the whole aircraft leasing industry, feel very, very good about the future. Despite all the orders that have been leveled and placed through today, guess what? If we start looking at the single on market, only 65% of the current A320 family operators, there's only 65% of the current family operators, they have no backlog. Sitting here today, after all these orders, 65% of our A320 operators don't have any backlog for new aircraft. None. Zero. What about the Boeing side? Boeing's chart. Well, Boeing doesn't want to give you a chart. They list who the airlines are. And what does this say? There are about 100 operators globally operating about 1,500 737s that have no max and no NEO orders. In other words, no new single aisle generation aircraft on board. None. Zip. And I'm sure Boeing put this in there for our benefit, since I'm giving the presentation today. But I think it's true that the leasing channel, you've seen by the numbers, you've seen by the percentages, will absolutely play a key role in not only broadening, but deepening the marketplace. If you add to that percentage the number of A330 operators who just have current generation A330s on board, the so-called A330 CEO, current airplane, that number moves to 49%. Another way of saying that is 49% of the A330 operators have no new technology wide body aircraft on board. Folks, I gotta tell you, these numbers and these statistics are music to my ears as an aircraft lessor. I'm sure they're music to the ears of all the aircraft lessors present today. Let's round this out and look at the wide bodies going forward. A very colorful, busy looking chart. But basically what it represents is all the different airframe types that are reaching, in fact, 25 years of age going forward. And guess what? This is projected, of course, but it's based upon some pretty good scrubbing numbers. So look at this. By the year 2021, 22, 23, the peak of the replacement for the current wide bodies in terms of absolute numbers of aircraft that, I'm sorry, that need, there we go, that need replacement. So again, these aircraft are reaching 25 years of age, 2021, 22, 23. A little commercial announcement for Airlease Corporation. Guess when Airlease has most of its new technology wide body delivery? 2021, 2022, and 2023. So having now looked at the single aisle and twin aisle marketplace, what's that give us? Bottom line is this. Tremendous opportunity for the single aisle, uh, for the single aisle product to grow the max and the neo base. 100 operators, fleets of 60, 50, 7, 37. This is the bone chart. Give me credit for this. Uh, and on the white body side, many, many long-term decisions yet to be made, even after all these orders have been placed. Over 40 airlines with 700 plus wide bodies that do not have a 787, A330 neo, or A350 aircraft on board. 
And Boeing likes to point out that about 60 airlines operating 777s throughout the world still don't have a 777 order. So where is this taking us? Kind of a summary slide. Here's the bottom line. Global productivity measures are at or near peaks. The airlines are adjusting capacity to demand. They're becoming more and more financially disciplined. Passenger load factors are, in fact, at record highs. Fleet utilization is, in fact, at or near peaks with minimal aircraft parked. All the productivity indicators remain strong. Traffic going up 6.2%, forecast to continue at a high level going forward. Load factors about 80% at an all-time high. Finally, some profits in the airline leasing industry are projected to be about $18 billion for 2014. Utilization of aircraft since versus 2003 up to 10 to 15%, and park fleet at an all-time low of some 10 to 15 years. So let me ask you, what can we conclude? What do I hope that you conclude from this? Number one, sitting here today, as best we can see it, we think we actually have a relatively healthy ecosystem that exists with no definitive evidence of impending bubbles or downturn globally in the industry. Sure, we have some airlines reporting weaker profits, Lufthansa, KLM, and Europe, although the are very strong. I can cite you any region in the world that quite an airline that's going to run into profit problems. That's a steady state uh, factor we have in this industry. But going forward and sitting here today, we see things in a relatively healthy balance. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say that I endorse, promote, or encourage a lot of production rate increases. But you can see from these charts that, in fact, the demand is overwhelming and remains overwhelming. With that being said, I would offer a caution. Yes, we can increase production rates. Yes, it's a natural thing for Boeing and Airbus to do. There's plenty of business for all the lessors to fill a lot of the shortfall that exists there. But for those of us that have been in the industry some 30 years and have gone through many, many wars, I would urge caution. Despite all the robustness that you see today, it is very difficult for this industry to increase production levels to the rates that we're seeing projected here today. The more we go in rate production, the less our comfort levels are there. And in fact, I would suggest to you that the more risk margin we reduce, the higher we can production rates. I'm not arguing for or against. I'm simply saying the numbers support an amazing demand. The manufacturers are under huge pressure to increase these because the demand is real, it's there. Still, we in the industry who have been there a long time are going to urge caution. We want to be very careful about how far we go. And the infrastructure and supply chain side that represents our industry and that is vital for our industry is already maximally strained. That's not the focus of this talk. That's not what I'm going to talk about. But you all know sitting here today that that supply chain is extremely strained. So, what am I saying here? Things are pretty healthy. Things are okay. Let's be very careful going forward and not in, eat into our risk margins going forward with overambitious production rates. Second bullet point, strong passenger growth now and in the future does suggest a continuation of that industry strength. In fact, we believe strongly that the net of added seats and capacity will in fact be absorbed in the near medium term. I think the charts that have been shown hopefully make that clear. The world population is growing. The emerging markets are growing. There's a compounding effect added traffic growth every single year. That traffic passenger growth is going to continue. One of the most important conclusions, I think, and I showed you that cyclical chart, improved airline capacity and financial discipline, I think you can say not only will, but has, and will moderate and reduce cyclical amplitudes. Fourth conclusion. What happens when demand exceeds supply? 
When you need more new airplanes than you can get, what happens? Actually, quite simple. And I can only tell you that in our careers past at ILFC, et cetera, some of the most profitable transactions we ever made were during the downside. We bought a lot of airplanes at very depressing prices. We made a lot of money moving airplanes, collecting fees, perhaps even terminating Earth leases early in order to accommodate adjustments that were needed in the industry. And we, the lessors, play an important and more important role every single day on moderating this balance. And if we do it right, we can do it profitably. So what's my final conclusion? We don't think that we are on the cusp of a cyclical downturn. We don't think it's anticipated near the medium term. But should there be any dislocation that we sincerely, based on 30 years of experience, don't see today, should there be that dislocation, if we are smart, that dislocation will represent opportunities for all of us in the aircraft leasing space. I thank you very much for your time.